Hi. I'm Wendy Allison, that I think makes me one of the Allisons, but I'm not actually <laughs> sure. Um, I'm the director of Know Your Stuff NZ, and I have been really, really happy to hear over the last couple of days so many people speaking in support of hearing the voices of the people who are affected by the law. Um, know Your Stuff NZ came into being as a response to adulteration in the festival scene, adulteration of illicit substances. I'll tell you a story. <laughs> the, I was at an event in 2014 and there were some pills going around on site that were known as the black pills. The black pills, apparently some of them were really, really good. Um, the others were a mimic that looked exactly the same as the really, really good pills that everybody was talking about, and they were not really good. People ended up in the medics, they were having a horrible time, there were psychotic episodes, six to eight hours of feeling really, really unwell, and the medics approached the organisers of the event and said, if you don't do something about this, somebody is going to die. So, members of the community got together with the organisers of this event and said what are our options we looked at we came up with three options one is to do nothing which would eventually lead to a death the next one was a zero tolerance policy and i would just like to say to anyone who's tried to actually implement zero tolerance how's that working out for you <laughs> yeah <laughs> so we discarded that as well and we looked at harm reduction now my background is in social policy and criminology and also event organisation and risk management. So I knew about drug chest checking as a harm reduction thing and I suggested that we try this. And so we worked with this event and they did not encourage our presence, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but what they did was they agreed to tolerate our presence and allow us to operate without advertising, without any signs without any indication that we were there at all and just quietly put it about that we were testing people's substances. And we, in the first year, we received 48 samples and of those only 20% appeared to contain any of the substances that people thought they had. Now we thought that was kind of scary and I wanted people to know about this and um, so I spoke with Russell Brown, <laughs> who then made me known to the NZ Drug Foundation, and they allowed me to stand up in front of a room people, full of people, much as yourselves, probably more enforcement people, and basically tell them they were doing it wrong. Um, that got me a certain amount of attention. And the, the upshot of that was that many people saw the benefits of telling people what was in their substances and on the other side of this it was becoming very very evident that the substances that are going around in New Zealand's festival scene are of very low and very fluctuating quality and people really don't know what they're taking. So we started, well we were keeping data about what we were doing. Um, one of the things that we started doing was asking people if they intended to take the substance once we had told them what we thought was in it. And anecdotally, about half of them were saying, no, no, we're not going to take that. We thought it was the relatively safe MDMA, but now we don't know what it is, we're not going to take that. And we thought that was kind of relevant because one of the arguments we hear again and again and again about drug checking is what is the message we are sending? Are we condoning the use of drugs? And this perhaps counterintuitive result we're actually getting is that people are deciding not to use drugs because of us. Um, and on, in terms of the message, I don't think people actually care that much what message the government is sending them about whether or not they use drugs. People are, the people who come to us have bought drugs and intend to take them despite that. So essentially, I believe that by not implementing harm reduction, the message we're sending is we don't care if you die. Um, and I've heard that a few times over the last couple of days. So flash forward a couple of years, we'd been working with this one event, we'd been getting consistent results about what we were finding and the decisions that people were making. And the problem, one of the problems we were having was that the technology we were using, which is reagent testing, which Fiona touched on, you drip as small chemical onto the sample and it will change colour and indicate its content. Um, 
That's all it can do. It can identify the main ingredient in a pill and it cannot tell you what the purity is or what else is in there. We needed better technology and the Drug Foundation in a display of what Ann Fordham yesterday described as principled non-compliance, thank you Ross, went out and bought an FTR, FTR spectrometer. It's on the table over there. You can go have a look at it if you like. It fits in a briefcase. It doesn't even go beep. It's not very interesting. But the useful thing to us is it's portable and it allows us to identify the ingredients in a substance with confidence. We can now test a substance and tell people what's in it. And this year, what we found, this festival season, we went to eight different events. And what we found was that 20% of the substances we tested contained none of the substance that people thought they had. So that's a one in five chance of having something that's not what you thought. A further 11% contained other things, adulterants, um, you name it, other psychoactives, pharmaceuticals. We didn't find any concrete, but we did find quite a lot of creatine. Um, <laughs> so there'll be people out there doing pull-ups on the dance floor. Um, <laughs> So if you add those numbers together, what you have is a nearly one in three chance of ingesting a substance that is not what you thought it was. And when people are confronted with this information, as Fiona pointed out, 52% of them then said that they would not take that substance. Um, a number of those people actually destroyed it in front of us. So again, I say to you that we are not encouraging drug use, we are actually discouraging it by going, here's what you've got, it's not what you thought. And I would hesitate to put a number on how many people have not had problems because of us. The same reasons that Fiona gave, we don't have access to data about drug-related hospitalizations at events, and hospitals don't keep separate data on whether drugs were involved in emergency situations or not. This is not accessible to us. However, anecdotally, we have also been told that there have been fewer hospitalizations at the events that we've been at. So it feels like it works, and I'm pretty sure that there are very few people in this room who disagree with that. You may have noticed us a little bit in the media in the last few days. Um, and when your socially conservative Prime Minister is confronted with the notion of harm reduction for the first time by being told that people have been clandestinely testing pills and he goes, I suppose that's a good idea, well, I'll take that. I think it's a no-brainer. Um, it's clear that quite a lot of other people think so too. So the, there are a few things that we do that are a little bit different from the UK. For example, we are not working with police. The reason that we opted not to do that was partly because when the police were approached, they were unwilling to form an accord. They were unable to speak freely about the work that we're doing in relation to the work they do. In effect, the law criminalises possession and use of these substances. The police's job is to enforce the law. They are also working at the Safer Communities Together aspect of their work, and this puts them in a very difficult situation because to create a safer community together they have to support us, but in order to support the law they have to arrest us, and um, we have been unable to get a clear accord with the police to work with them, so we have continued to do the work anyway because we think it's valuable and we wanted to produce evidence that it works because New Zealand suffers very, very badly from paralysis by analysis. Um, I've heard a lot of the show me the evidence information and again how much evidence is enough. We have evidence, we deliberately sought evidence without seeking permission first and we did that because we knew that if we sought permission we would get told no and people would be dead by now. Um, Another difference, the substances that we encounter are generally not pressed pills. We see a lot of crystals in capsules, it's sort of brownish. People go, oh look, it must be MDMA, it's a crystal. We go, we found 15 different things that look like that this year. You cannot tell by looking at your substance what it is. Get your stuff tested, people, and they are listening, which is nice. Um, a further thing that we do differently is we test the substances in front of people. 
People come to us and we take them through the process. We screen with reagents prior to putting them on, onto the spectrometer. And then while all of that is going on, it gives us an opportunity to have a conversation with people about drugs, about their drug use, about the things they are intending to take and safer ways to go about doing that, about what to do if they do feel unwell. When should you go and see the medic? When is it a medical emergency? So our intervention process is slightly different. Um, and we are not handling the substances at all because we are not doing it as part of a destruction process, even though some of them do end up being destroyed. So we are unable to touch them. We have the client do all of that in front of us, and sometimes that can be very frustrating when somebody is trying to slice a small amount off a pill after four days at a festival. But you, <laughs> you have to keep your hands off. Um, and I agree with Fiona that we are not inciting people to commit a crime because all of these people came to us with the intention to commit a crime and by being in pos possession of substances that they thought were illegal, they have already committed a crime. Therefore, I feel that that argument again is another red herring. I'm aware I haven't got very much time. Um, <laughs> Ross is in control of the clicker. Okay, so what I would like to say now is we're doing it anyway. We are going to keep doing it. The law should get out of our way. Everyone thinks it's a great idea. We have a harm reduction based national drug policy, which shows that we already have the political will. We already have the intention to create the structures. We have everything except a law that allows us to do it. And all we're asking for is a very small change to Section 12 of the Misuse of Drugs Act. The Section 12 makes it an offence to knowingly permit a venue to be used for offences against the Act, and this makes any organiser who gets us in into a criminal, and that makes them risk their livelihood, it makes them risk their insurance, essentially it makes it very, very difficult for them to continue if they openly acknowledge that they're trying to do something about this. Um, set against that, we have the shiny new Health and Safety at Work Act, which makes event organisers personally responsible for the safety of the people at their event. They are required by law to take all practicable steps to ensure people's safety. Um, and yet this Section 12 of the Misuse of Drugs Act is standing in the way of them actually doing that. And if you look at most festivals' drug policy, it will be zero tolerance. They will say it's against the law and we do not condone the use of drugs and that's as far as it goes. They have to sneak us in. This is wrong. Let's fix this law. Um, further things that we need to look at is funding. At the moment we have the use of a spectrometer. Thank you to the NZ Drug Foundation again. The rest of our work is self-funded. This is not sustainable. The opportunity cost and the actual upfront cost of this is $35 per test. And we, we cannot keep doing this. We need sources of funding. So we are running a Pledge Me campaign in an attempt to purchase a second spectrometer, which will allow us to be at more than one event at a time. But we will also need to cover ongoing costs. Again, State support will allow us to openly seek funding, to seek grants, and to work with organisations like universities who have shown a lot of interest in our work. Um, so we need to look at how we get our funding applied. And capability, we need volunteers. Um, I note that Fiona said they have a, a bank of 250 volunteers. We currently have 10. We need more people. Part of the reason for this is because nobody knew what we were doing until four days ago. So um, <laughs> the, we're, we're putting in a plug for our Pledge Me here. That's probably the most important thing to do if what you have to offer is money, is to help us get a second spec, but also spreading the word and letting it be known that we have a need for volunteers. We are capable of increasing our, our capability of training people and so we need to also get those people in who are interested in what we're doing. We are interested in having a discussion about what best practice looks like. And this, this is a job essentially for when our work has been legitimised properly. Meanwhile, we are going to continue doing what we're doing, but we would like some support in order to create best practice, institutional support. Next season, we would like to be doing it with the support of the police. Currently, the police are, let's just say, pretending they haven't seen us. Um, this is not good enough. 
because that does allow for any enthusiastic police officer or anybody who's seen me on TV and thinks that what we're doing is condoning the use of drugs to shut us down instantly and we would like a much better arrangement with the police than that. Um, so I guess the final thing that I'd like to say is that I'm a woman, I'm here in this, in, in, this, in this symposium talking to you because the Drug Foundation has seen the importance of raising the voices of people who are often not heard. I have a colleague, Dr. Jez Weston, I would like to just put in a plug for him because he's been very supportive. However, whenever Jez and I stand up together and talk about this, everyone thinks it's his project and they ask him the questions. <laughs> And I have also noticed since we went in the, into the media that we have a partnership with the NZ Drug Foundation who have been utterly fantastic in making sure that we are actually credited for the work we do, but the media has not been quite so good at that. And you may have noticed Peter Dunn yesterday morning in his opening speech also mentioning that the drug checking was being run by the Drug Foundation and forgetting that we exist. Um, and the thought that I would like to leave you with is everyone thinks this is a no-brainer, everybody thinks this is a great idea. The people who we are helping are predominantly white middle-class kids, okay? I am white and middle-class and I am very, very aware from the conversations this morning and from my work in social policy that if, if I were brown and the people we were trying to help were brown, it wouldn't have been so easy. I think that Kiri this morning talked about drop-in centres and wellness centres, they are also harm reduction. We are talking about, Mary Ann talked about supervised injection facilities, they are also harm reduction. And I am painfully aware that this has been far too easy because we are white middle class community. And I would just like to point out that the thing that I think what we're doing can achieve for other communities who are not as privileged as ourselves is some level of understanding of what harm reduction actually means so that we can perhaps make it easier for other communities to introduce harm reduction that is slightly less acceptable. Thank you.